This is Soon News TV, and you're listening to the iWeekly Show. Welcome to the iWeekly Show, the premier place for news, headlines and analysis on all things iRacing, the premier online racing simulator. I am your host for today, Mr. Hashtag, do you mind himself, Jake Sperry, bringing you the rundown on all things iRacing for the next half an hour. Well, it has been a slow week this week on iRacing. There's been no World Championships, no iRacing Grand Prix Series. You haven't had the likes of VLN, no Blank Pan, no World Tours. And there also hasn't been any NASCAR P County Free Series to comment and critique on either. So with this being the very first podcast of its kind on iRacing here on Sim News TV, it is worth just taking a step back to what happened the week before last and the latest round of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series. Of course, that kicked off from Imola with ourselves over halfway through the season looking at possibly one of the most unprecedented seasons that we've ever seen, arguably since Gregor Hutu's efforts in 2010, 11, 12. You've got the likes of Martin Kronke, who takes a seventh straight victory, beating out legitimately everyone hand over fist by 10 seconds yet again uh, in second position for that one we had the driver of Freak Schothorst nice to see him returning to the podium he did need that podium quite a bit I think for his career at Team Redline and then Bonnet House who is second in championship scoring only his second podium of the season so I do want to talk about Martin Kronke first and foremost here in terms of the racing action that went on because Martin Kronke is 7 for 7 this season. He's 100%. It is a shortened season, so he's got five races to go overall in the championship. So in terms of beating the overall race wins record for a season, he can't do that because, of course, it used to be a 16-race championship in the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series, changed to 12 races for this season. But he can do something that maybe Gregor Hutu couldn't do, and that's go 100% of the season unbeaten. You're talking about a man who is 7 from 7. You're talking about a man who, going on from last season, has 10 wins in the last 11 starts that he's raced. Martin Kronke has been dominant Nobody has been able to touch him so far over this season. And with Martin Kronke and what he can do in terms of being a driver, it seems sky's the limit right now. I mean, he qualifies three-tenths of a second quicker than anybody else in the field. And this is a strong field, mind you. You've still got drivers like Graham Carroll, like Mac Backham, his own teammate. You've got drivers in there like... Freak Schothorst, Bono House, drivers like Chen Bollock Bassi, Isaac Price, all of which could get themselves high up the field. Talk about the likes of Marcus Jensen as well. And he blitzed absolutely everyone. Nobody was going to catch Martin Kronke through qualifying. Through the race in the opening couple of laps, he breaks out of DRS range. And from there, he just slowly eases away before manifesting up a 10 second gap come the end of the race pretty effortlessly I would have to say Uh, I don't know how you actually beat Martin Kronke though and I'm not sure anyone else does but I think the first thing you have to do is actually out qualify him and even then that's not going to be a guarantee Martin Kronke you look at his stats he's five pole positions I believe in his opening seven starts to the season and with that ability of just being so dominant in the early stages of a season, I'm not sure there's much you can do to catch him. In terms of the way that he has worked out during the season as well, you talk about his ability to make positions up, even though he wasn't necessarily the fastest in qualifying. Even if you do beat him qualifying, you have to then go and try and beat him on the one-stop strategy. You've got to try and beat him over a race distance, And you've got to make sure that you can hold off 
on a race pace which nobody so far has managed to be proven otherwise on. I think that with Martin Cronke, there were a couple of blips in the season where people thought that he was human. You talk about the likes of, say, uh, Sebring, where he has been in a position to be pushing forward quite a bit in terms of the work that he'd been done. Did have himself in a situation where he had to come from third on the grid, got himself his way through. And you also have to look at the way that he was dealing at the circuit of Monza as well. The fact that if you look at the way that he's been working and the fact that he did have to get past drivers consistently, he did make that one mistake during that race, did drop himself back a position. Martin Kronke is human. He does have an ability to make mistakes, but so far this season, nobody's been able to capitalise on it. You talk about Oli Packler at Silverstone. He wasn't able to really capitalise on the fact that he made a mistake coming out of Cop's Corner and there was a run down to Stowe, which was his only opportunity to make the move. And in the end, Kronke did defend that very well. And from there on in, he walked away again. I think that someone actually has to put in the time and dedication to really get himself forward. Be that a Bono House, be that a Freak Show Thorst, be that whoever it may be, someone's actually got to do something to really challenge Martin Kronke. And so far this season, I don't think he has been really challenged that much. And it shows being 100% having basically a free pass, shall we say, heading to Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the road course. He doesn't actually have to score points with the one drop week implemented in the series. I think Martin Kronke actually has a chance to relax for a a month, maybe, a month and a bit. I think Martin Kronke has that ability to take his foot off the gas a little bit here. If he wants to push for 100%, you still go out to try and win it. But honestly, he's 60 points clear in a championship right now, not including drop weeks. I think he's pretty safe. And you've got Bonner House as well in second on 217 points, who has only led two laps this season compared to the 372 laps that Martin Kronke's led, it does show you something. It does show you that he does need to do a little bit more, does Bonner House. And to actually talk about Bonner House for a little bit, this is still his first season in the Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series. And the adage quote from Will Vincent is, if he doesn't win a race this season, he can consider this season as a failure. And I think quite a few drivers up and down the grid have that same feeling. You talk about drivers like Graham Carroll, you have that feeling about. You talk about Bonner House, that feeling. You talk about maybe someone like Gregor Hutu would have had that feeling. But for Bonner House, it's been consistency. It's been third place finishes, fourth place finishes, fifth place finishes every single time. He's got four finishes inside the top five. He hasn't retired from a race so far. Qualifies on average sixth, average finishes around fifth. That doesn't win you a championship, but what it does do, it gives you consistency and it gives you good points and it's a very good foundation to build on, especially for a debut season, especially for someone who, when I looked at in the road to pro qualifying, that he did struggle a lot, that Bonner House was manhandling a vehicle and the fact that he was really struggling to deal with the amount of oversteer that the McLaren MP430 gave him. So I think Bonner House has developed nicely. He's got used to the vehicle. And I think that now he is starting to push and actually get some worthy results. I think he does need a second place now to keep the championship alive. He needs Kronke to crash out at two of the last four events to really give himself any form of a chance. But that's the thing. Martin Kronke last season won three of those four events of the last four of the season. I could very easily see him winning all four of them this time round. So it comes down to a fact of where Bonner House stands in terms of this race and if he does get the support of Team Redline behind him. Now, I, I do want to talk about Team Redline a little bit more because the big story actually that came out from Imola was Gregor Hutu, five-time world champion in iRacing, absent for a second straight week. And for Gregor Hutu, that's weird because... What Gregor Hutu does and who he has been and what he has been and what he's done, he's not the sort of person who misses races for the sake of missing races. 
Gregor Hutu missed four races across his entire iRacing career in the World Championship Grand Prix Series before actually getting to this season where he's missed two back-to-back, which seems pretty off. I mean, he has been moving house, which is one thing, and internet can be a bit of a predicament, and I honestly think that Gregor Hutu has maybe given up his challenge for the championship. He hasn't got a race victory this season, which by this point, in every season he's raced so far, he's got at least two or three to his name. I think Gregor Hutu knows he's beaten compared to Martin Kronke. I think that Gregor Hutu has other things on his mind. And for Gregor Hutu, he is a driver who makes snap decisions And that comes all the way back to, say, 2002. He leads the championship in the FSR World Championship back when it was on uh, Grand Prix Career Challenge 2. And, well, 2002, shall I say. And he gets himself four race victories. He doesn't win the fifth. And then suddenly he doesn't race for the rest of the season. So, Gregor Hutu is a man who makes snap calls from time to time. And here, when he's not getting any return out of his first five races and has only scored 154 points second in championship isn't catching Martin Kronke. You have to feel that maybe for Gregor Hutu, there is a little bit more at stake. And the fact that he does drop out now means that he's got something else which he values more important than, say, oh, I don't know, the Irish Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series. And I'm here to propose World's Fastest Gamer because for anyone who knows what Team Redline is and what Team Redline does, Team Redline does have a very good ability at translating sim racing into the real world and actually creating opportunities for their drivers. You've got to talk about their adrenaline program that they've got with the likes of Neil Verhagen and Richard Vershaws, part of the Red Bull Academy, actually using iRacing, using Redline services to develop their ability to go forward. It's no secret that Max Verstappen, who is arguably one of the brightest prospects in Formula One right now, is part of Team Redline and is working time after time again to make something happen. I'll give an example of Max Verstappen. He's around the outside move in his debut season at at Spa-Francorchamps at Blanchemont. He puts that down to the fact that he was training consistently in the Williams FW31 on iRacing with Atsi Kirkhoff and going round that corner and trying to battle and drive side by side again and again so he knew how much room he actually had to work with at that time. So Team Redline knows how to make certain drivers work. I mean you still talk of likes of say Lando Norris who is arguably the cover star right now for World's Fastest Gamer and should be and really can be a great F1 driver in the future if he gets himself up there. I think Lando Norris and the work that he puts in on iRacing, I think that's very crucial to his development as well. But I am going ever so slightly on a tangent here. So to bring it back to, say, how sim racers get out into that real world, you have to talk about Enzo Benito. He's now the official simulator driver for Tachita in the Formula E series. And to get that position and to have security in that sense from a driver who has really been on the edge of sim racing for the last two years, you have to feel. I think that for Enzo Benito, that suits him quite nicely and does him quite a bit of justice. But put more into perspective with Gregor Hutu, world's fastest gamer, I think, is what he's thinking about. A guaranteed one-year deal with McLaren, working on a simulator, working hand-in-hand with Lando Norris, who he already knows very well, uh, being around the likes of Fernando Alonso, getting guaranteed money coming in so he doesn't have to do what he does on a day-to-day basis already because, as we all know, sim racing doesn't naturally pay or hasn't paid until this year. I think it comes down to a point of Gregor Hutu is getting on. He is in his mid-30s. He doesn't have that same ability on reflexes. He doesn't have that same ability to bounce back and put in all the effort to beat a new upcomer. 
it's not 2012 again where he can beat a driver like Hugo Luis, formerly of My3ID, basically via Esco and a Simsport as well. I don't think Gregor Hutu has enough in him at his age to actually beat Martin Kronke heads up again. I think that for Gregor Hutu, I think he is starting to put all his eggs in the world's fastest game of basket. You talk about likes of his his playtime on Steam even, which I had a look at, and he's put in over the last two weeks at least 50 hours on our Factor 2. He hasn't touched iRacing for eight days. I have to remember, I am filming this on a Friday, and it's coming out to you here today on a Tuesday, but you have to feel for Gregor Hutu that he is thinking that World's Fastest Gamer is a legitimate opportunity. He can put in the times and the efforts to beat certain drivers. I mean, we're not sure, because I'm filming this on a Friday, if he is one of the selected six. You you think that Gregor Hutu is with his reputation. So far, only the only driver that has been called up is Noble2909 on YouTube, a.k.a. Harry Jacks. So for Gregor Hutu, he sees a great opportunity. He sees guaranteed money for a year. He sees a job doing what he loves. And he sees sim racing paying for him. And although everyone wants sim racing to be developmental and this booming esport, which does showcase everything at the greatest level, you feel that Gregor Hutu is probably the most qualified person to get into that situation. Of course, he's got to go through the whole thing and try and win it. But to be putting in the effort now when nothing's been released yet, that makes me feel that Gregor Hutu is focusing on this world's fastest gamer over the iRacing World Championship. And I think that Gregor Hutu, in that sense, has given up. And it's time for me to be the Eddie Jordan of sim racing because for those people who do know me, I am not afraid to put out an opinion. I am not afraid to say what I'm thinking, say what I feel. And I feel and I think that for Gregor Hutu, it comes down to this. If Gregor Hutu wins this World's Fastest Gamer, he doesn't do another race in the Irish World Championship this season. And that might mean that he drops from sixth where he is right now in the standings outside the top 13 would need to qualify back in. That's no problem for Gregor Hutu. He'd probably get in every day of the week. But should a driver like Gregor Hutu ever be in that position? The answer is no. But maybe he'd take a year out from the World Championship Grand Prix Series, do what Michael Schumacher did, come back, say, a year down the line, two years down the line, three years down the line, really have that desire to go win a sixth championship back again and really go and push for it because Gregor Hutu could win a sixth world championship. He has the skills under his belt and he really could do it. But I think for Gregor Hutu, I think it has to be that he has to win world's fastest gamer. I think in his mind, it's that all bust because I really don't see Gregor Hutu coming back last one, two races with not much desire, just wanting to qualify for the next season and then put the effort in from there. I think Gregor Hutu is close to retirement, in my opinion. How close that is, it might be one year down the line. It might be at the end of this season, for all we know. It might be three years, four years, five years. But you can't say that Team Redline is not preparing for the eventuality that Gregor Hutu or Oli Pakula decide to call it quits. They have Bono House, they have Freak Shothors, they have Graham Carroll in their mists that they can put up there and put up there at the highest level. You can even talk about Alexius Yakula if you want, if he does decide to race a full season. There is a lot of potential at Redline to still become the leading team or one of the leading teams in iRacing. But it comes down to this, Gregor Hutu can only decide Gregor Hutu's fate right now. It's not down to Martin Kronke anymore. It's not down to anyone else. It's not down to Bonner House, Freak Shothorst, what have you. Down to Gregor Hutu and the way that Gregor Hutu wants to conduct himself. So in my opinion, watch out for World's Fastest Gamer because that's where we will see Gregor Hutu 
whether he has to qualify into it or not. From there, though, you do have to still talk about the Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series a little bit more because Frank Schothor, second position, really did need that second position. He was dropping back in the championship. He was struggling a little bit to get results. His qualifying had been okay. His race pace had dropped him a little bit further back. He had some disappointing qualifying and an even more disappointing race at Monza. Did take a week out to really try and find himself again, but he is back up there, second position during the race, holding off Bono House's teammate. And Frank Schothorst is showing that he's not just some added baggage. I think Frank Schothorst needed a good result and has a good result. Now P5 in the championship needs to crack on, needs to push, needs to start really trying to work with Bono and Ollie and Graham as well to really find the setup and find the pace that beats Martin Cronke. It's also Frank Schothorst's first season. Take no credit away from him. We talked about Bono House, talked about Frank Schothorst. Uh, we do need to talk about Marty Piatella, though, for VRS Coanda Simsport, because he starts from 19th. He has an awful qualifying. He makes his way up through the field. He finishes P5. He's now third in the championship. And you ask yourself, what has Marty Piatella done this season? The answer is not very much. He's just finished consistently. Marty Piatella is the most underrated driver in the field. Doesn't do things glamorously. He doesn't score the big results, but he scores the consistent results. And he scores again and again and again. And that's why he's position three right now with a drop week still to be applied. I think Marty Piatella is very underrated, as I've said before. But I think that Marty Piatella could be a driver that could lead a team at some stage if he did ever decide to go away from VRS Grand Sim Sport. Marty Piatella is so valuable. But yet at the same time, because he's so valuable, he is very undervalued to what he brings to VRS Coanda Simsport. I think Marty Piatella does a very good job in that area. You have to talk about the fuel saving issues that were present at the Irish World Championship race as well. Drivers like Chen Bollett Bassi fell back due to running out of fuel. Daniel Wensing for the Radicals Online team started running out of fuel. You know, People did struggle. It allowed drivers like Isaac Price of course sim racing, of course Shen Bolabasi also of course sim racing, to get a best result of the season of position number seven. And for course sim racing, I like the direction they're going. They were pretty much nowhere in the World Championship Grand Prix Series, you could argue, even in January. And then suddenly, with Apex Racing UK shedding drivers left and right, course sim racing picks up a couple of drivers. And they have themselves this really nice group, this really nice collective and friendship that really could do something come 2018. They're already doing well in Blank Pan. They're leading that one, potentially 1-2 at the moment. But I'd actually watch out for Course Sim Racing next year. I reckon they could make some really big challenges and really move forward to challenge the likes of Redline and Kwanda. With that done, I do want to move on to something a little bit more into the future here on iWeekly, shall we say. And that's my heads up at this stage of the year, we're recording in July, for the Road to Pro. Because there will be drivers who want to get into that Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series. There are 20 spots available, and I reckon there will be drivers who will be pushing to get themselves through. It's not concrete who's going to go out and will have to re-qualify back in. But just to give an example of some of the drivers who are technically out at the moment, you got Mitchell De Jong in position 31. I reckon he'll do at least two, three more races, get himself back up inside the top 30. That much do have to worry about. It'll be a massive shock if he is locked out. Got likes of Lucas Gotch for MSP Phoenix Racing. I do expect him to re-qualify again. I don't think he's had the support this season to really keep himself going. I have worked with him before. He is someone who does work very well with a core group around him. Talk about drivers like Michael Dinkle for Apex Racing UK. He shouldn't be down there. Uh, drivers like Diogo Oliveira, I think, could put in a little bit more effort, maybe race a couple more times, get himself up there for the Positive Sim Racing team. Drivers like Marin Cholak, actually, former World Touring Car Championship driver, really shouldn't be down here. Same could be said for maybe 
someone like Riley Preston, who has been very unlucky. I know that he has maybe a couple of work commitments, which is stopping him from racing. And actually, Robin Friskops as well, and Jake Sturgis, both Inex racing drivers, only done the one race this season. Inex have really scaled back their effort and have decided to focus more on blank pan. And I think for Inex, that does work for them. But they sort of left Joni Tamala on his own, which I don't quite like from Inex to be quite critical. And I think that they can do a little bit more of that in the future. Besides the point, there are a few drivers who I think could make their way through to qualifying next season. That really should be on your radar for anyone that is listening here on Sim News TV to get yourself forward. Drivers like, say, Jerome Krakel for the Origin Front Row Sim Racing team. You talk about a driver here who is an FSR champion in 2016. You talk about Bonner House being a five time champion. Granted, the field's maybe a little bit weaker in 2016, but Jerome Krakel is a champion. He has respect and. He has a level about him that says that he can go out and win races and win races at a very, very high and substantial level. For him, he, he's been trying to work alongside Dan Brewer, get himself up through with his I rating, get himself up into that position where he can do those races well. I saw him race Formula Renaults in the Apex Online Racing Formula Renault Championship. He is an incredibly quick driver. And... There shouldn't be much doubt in the fact that he can qualify a vehicle very well. I saw him start at the back at Road Atlanta just uh, Sunday in the Iris and Grand Prix Series, not the uh, World Championship Grand Prix Series. I should stress that we have had the uh, Iris and Grand Prix Series race as well, but of course we're recording on a Friday, so didn't really quite catch that for now. But I think Jerome Krakel is one of the favourites to win. I think that if he does find himself two, three tenths of a second, he does challenge the main drivers. He does become a threat. And he could be the first person to do the double crown. Of course, he's got to get around Bono House. That's one thing to keep in mind. But Jerome Krakel has a good turn of pace about him, working with Origin. And if he was picked up for another team, like, say, an Apex or an Inex or any of that, Jerome Krakel could be someone who is really someone to look at. Another drive to keep an eye out on, Sebastian Job. A lot of potential in this young man. Uh, joined the series very, very early in his career, about a couple of years ago with Apex Racing UK. And arguably did have a very bad 2016, in my opinion. He was outside the top 30 of the qualification spaces, so he had to go through qualifying. And from there, it basically looked like he was giving up a little bit, and he dropped out of that entirely and decided no he didn't want to do that i got a lot of flack personally for calling him out on it he moves to core sim racing which i did predict not gonna brag about that though and sebastian job looks very comfortable now as a driver he is finding himself doing things that he wants to do like the 2k world cup he is doing things that he wants to do like work very closely alongside frederick rasmussen isaac price you could even talk about cross teams and zach thomas at the uh, Radicals Online team. Sebastian Job, I think, should be going up there. And as arguably a favourite to be a future champion, Sebastian Job should be in that series and should be doing very well. I want to talk about Alexia Loma, though, for Inex as well. I think that as a driver, he was a little bit caught in two minds last season when he went for qualification because. He was caught up in the Visa Vegas E-Race. And the fact that he was caught up in that shows that he is one of the test be 10 best sim racers in the world. Apparently, Martin Cronke was missing. Um, but Alexia Loma should be a driver that should get in, whether he's in top 10 or not. That's a different question. If Alexia Loma wants to make that push and wants to really help out drivers like Joni Tamala in there, he should be a mainstay. He should be going in there and putting in that effort because Alexia Loma is quick. He is the uh, Finnish sim racing champion for ESM. He has that ability to push it at the highest level, and I think that Alexia Loma should be up there and should be in qualifying. Other drivers I want to talk about are Michael Partington. Just signed a deal with Evolution Racing Team. I think that 
is brilliant for him. He is one of the newer drivers. He's only popped up in iRacing over the last year or so, six months. But he has been really quick. And with Evolution Racing Team looking to expand a little bit more, buying the likes of, say, Simone Maria Marcheno, I think that Michael Partington has a lot of room to develop and could be a driver who is very, very valuable two or three years down the line. Of course, the other driver I want to talk about, Ricardo Orozco for TNT. Uh, with Benjamin Lindsay being quite on the fringes, shall we say, I think Orozco is spearheading this team. I think that Ricardo Orozco can push at the highest level because he has got two races in the Grand Prix series. He should be able to qualify. It's down to the fact of if he can qualify. And I think that for Ricardo Orozco, I think he certainly can be one of those drivers who does that on the day-to-day and should be, in quotation, should be inside the top 20 come January, February. And of course, those are my opinions. And you are very welcome to ask me a question that may get featured here on this podcast at any time you like. You can catch me on Twitter, hashtag do you mind, at Jake underscore Sperry. I mean, you can always catch the whole page iWeekly SN as well, at iWeekly SN. Ask us a question through message. You can ask it through Twitter, however way you want. But you're welcome to have a message whenever you like. I will try and read out as many messages as I can. If I can't manage to make time here in this podcast, I will get back and make it on my Twitter as well. So, you know, there's a lot of potential here between me and you here in this first ever thing to get itself going. And of course, this is going to be weekly here, so there's going to be a lot of news all the time that I'm going to be trying to cover here. Likes the IRS World Championship, which I focused on solely here today. It likes Road to Pro when you get to the winter. The likes of, say, Neo Endurance. You talk about Blank Pan. You talk about the World Tour events, like the 24 Hours, the 12 Hours, Bathurst 1000, what have you. And you even talk about the likes of VLN that I do love to cover, and I would love to try and get in here from time to time. But of course, we are here weekly. 6 o'clock p.m. is always going to be our release time. Our next one comes up on the 25th of July. So make sure that you check that one out for us here on Sim News TV. Make sure that you leave a subscription down below here on this channel here at Sim News TV. But for the time being, I've been hashtag Do You Mind Jake Sperry. And this has been the iWeekly Show.